Well, good morning. morning. Jayvon, that woke us up. (laughs) That's like thunder and lightning in San Diego. It never happens. Well, uh, welcome. There are a number of announcements, but first and most importantly, if you're visiting with us, we're grateful that you're here. And please, you can find your way out across the patio and uh, someone will be there at the little booth and they can give you more information about the church. I invite all of you to take the little blue card that's in the pew in front of you and if you would please register your attendance so that we will know you are here. This coming Saturday, we will be having a special church conference. You can read more about that in the bulletin, but you're invited to come. It will be one of the most unusual church conferences uh, you will ever attend. And one of the reasons for that is that we had a baptism scheduled right here on Saturday morning, and we're going to have the church conference right here on Saturday morning. So guess what we're going to do? We're going to meet for about a half an hour, and then we're going to celebrate a baptism together. And then we'll meet after that. So uh, this may be a church conference for you to remember, and it may help us know why we do what we do as we meet together. Uh, I want to remind you that there are suggestion boxes uh, as to what you would desire in the attributes or characteristics or qualities of the next lead pastor. It really does make a difference. Uh, Bishop Grant Hagia will be meeting with the Pastor Parish Relations Committee on Tuesday of this week. And so if you want to be sure that your ideas are considered, at least at this point, uh, just go to the link on the website or you can go to Linder Hall or the church office and share your ideas there. Uh, There's a book study. We're reading uh, Frederick Buechner's little book and we'll meet for the first time uh, next Sunday afternoon. And I encourage you uh, to take a read. It's the book, The Remarkable Ordinary. And we're reading a book once a month. So uh, you don't have to have read the book, just come and join us. Uh, Finally, I want to uh, invite uh, Priscilla Venegas to come. And uh, Priscilla is our uh, youth, our children's ministry director. Great to have you here. And you and I were talking this week about, well, what happens with children on Sunday morning? What happens when parents show up with children? Well, we have our uh, children and youth programs now fully underway. Uh, We have our Sunday school programs um, from preschool all the way up through high school. And um, we would love to have you join us. We have a full program from 9 to 10 a.m. is our Sunday school program. And we also have, uh, during our 1030 service, uh, uh, Imagination Station for our youngest disciples. So when my grandchildren come, uh, where should they meet you? Down on the uh, Yes, down at at the uh, plaza level in the bottom of the sanctuary. All right, and if they come to worship but decide they don't want to hear the preacher uh, (laughs) and they leave, what, what should they do? They need to sign in. Yes, yes, we need to have all of our children signed in at the bottom of the stairs. Uh, we have a full program throughout the morning, so uh, they are moving around campus, so we want to make sure we know where they are. So if you sign them in and sign them out every morning, that's uh, the rest of the call. Thank you, Priscilla. She does a terrific job on the behalf of our children, and I so appreciate that. <clears throat> uh, the lovely altar flowers today are in loving memory of Namar- Nirmala Sundaradas. And uh, she departed uh, two years ago from this early earthly veil and now dwells in the house of the Lord. And so the flowers are presented by her family and we're grateful. So, the peace of Christ be with you. Peace be with you. And the peace be with you. Would you please share the peace with one another?
Would you listen, uh, remain standing and listen as the choir begins our worship with the introit.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Dear Lord, of thee three things I pray, to see thee more clearly, to love thee more dearly, follow thee more nearly, day by day. Amen. I'd like to invite any other children who'd like to come forward. Parents, you're welcome to join them. And as they gather, uh, let's just sing that uh, together once, shall we? This, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine. Let it shine. Do you see this candle? You know what's something very special about this candle? This candle will never burn down. Yes, it, it will. You, yes, it will? No, it won't. I promise you. Because it's plastic? It's a very special candle that will never burn down. And the reason it will never burn down is because... What does it have in it? Water. Does it look like water? Oil. Yeah, you think it's oil. This candle 
has oil in it because somebody put oil in it. Who put oil in this candle? Does anybody know? I might have done it, but I think it was probably one of the ushers. The oil is in the candle because somebody came early to church and put oil in all the candles and got us ready for worship. Worship is something we all do together, and I'm so grateful to you for helping us worship today. Will you join me one more time in thanking the children for leading us in worship today? Let us pray. Will you pray with me? God, thank you for the privilege that it is to worship you. Thank you for making room for all of us in worship. Especially we thank you for these children who have led us in worship today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, kids, you're going to go, younger kids are going to go with your Sunday school teachers right out this door to Sunday school. And we're going to sing them out with a new song that's printed in your bulletin as we learn a new song for our children. Here we go. This lovely prayer quilt on the chancel rail this morning is for Virgil Vizina, and it will be on a table in the plaza after the service, and we are all invited to go and say a prayer and tie a knot into it, even though we might not know Virgil. Let us now enter into a time of prayer. Gracious and ever-present God, as the summer sunshine changes into the fall Santa Ana breezes and cool nights, we are reminded once again of your presence in creation and the changes in our lives because change symbolizes growth in the ways we see your world and our roles in that world. Help us grow not only in our sense of wonder, but in our sense of belonging and our need to contribute to the creation in which you have placed us and the bounty you have called upon us to share. We recognize our need for your grace, loving Father, because we do not live the kinds of lives that honor the trust placed upon us by the sacrifice of your only Son. He showed us in vivid detail how we were to live, not just in our own lives, but among our sisters and brothers, and we know that each and every day we fall short. We place our lives and living before you, and we ask, humbly ask your forgiveness. And more, we ask strength to improve the lives we lead and the examples we set for the children sharing our worship this morning. Healing Father, we approach you this morning seeking your hand in the lives of those suffering illnesses of the body and the spirit. We ask that you stand beside those who would bring healing to the body and the mind, assisting their skills and bringing peace to those who suffer affliction and to those who love them. We ask too that the prayer quilt dedicated to Virgil will wrap him in the love of this church family, bringing strength and reassurance. Father, around the world we hear of disaster piled upon disaster. There is an earthquake followed by a tsunami and then a hurricane followed by 
torrential rain and tornadoes. There are despots and terrorists burning and pillaging. And in all these tragedies, our fellow voyagers on this little earth are losing lives and livelihoods and families and homes. We pray for your mercies on them and for generous help, help that we can support to arrive for their physical needs. And may your spirit move over them to bring comfort in their times of grief and loss. And so, along with prayers deep in our hearts, known only to you and to us, we ask that all these things in the name of him who taught us when we pray to ask, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. During these Sundays, as we prepare for our Stewardship Sunday on October 28th, we have witness of all of the abundance, the generosity that we've been given. Uh, there's hardly a better witness than the children gave us this morning. And later, you're going to hear a witness that Sandy Price is going to share about the reach of this church globally as she talks about the mission trip to Tanzania. We simply want to take a moment right now to thank you for making all of this possible. If you would, please join me in our prayer for illumination. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today, amen.
Well, that takes care of the gospel reading and the sermon. <laughs> I invite you to stand now for the reading of the gospel today. It's from the 10th chapter of Mark, beginning with the 13th verse, and it's the familiar story of Jesus and the children. People were bringing little children to him in order that he might touch them, and the disciples spoke sternly to them. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, let the little children come to me, don't stop them. For it is such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Truly I tell you, who does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will not enter it. And he took them, held them in his arms, laid his hands on them and blessed them. The gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. be seated. Walter Wandgren, in that wonderful little children's book, Water Comes Down, has a poem that uh, is often used at baptism and other occasions. Uh, simple poem, but hear these words. All of us now on earth and in heaven, one mouth, ten mouths, ten million and seven, Greet you, friend, we're glad you came. So glad we stand and applaud, and we call you by your brand new name. Beautiful, beautiful child of flame, you are a child of God. Would you bow with me as we pray together? Oh God, we come this morning hoping that you will stretch the boundaries of our imagination, free us from categories that we entered this place with, so that we might be made anew as your children who seek after your kingdom in this place, on this earth. Amen. Many of you know that this is the 150th year, or it will be next year, we celebrate the anniversary of this church. Now that may seem like a long time, but actually 
in the history of Christianity. It's a short little time. Uh, some of you will know the story of the founding of the congregation. It began in 1869 as a group of 17 folks met in an old abandoned army barracks. Uh, in my mind's eye, I can see them there. I've read a little history. Uh, they gathered together and talked about what it would mean to have a Methodist meeting place in this city. Think about it, 1869, the Civil War had been passed for only four years. I imagine that walking the streets down in the city, uh, the rebels walked on one side and the Yankees walked on another. What would bring them together? Well, one of the things that did eventually was Methodism. Oh, we were split into two churches until the 1930s, but even so, we did talk with one another, even occasionally worship together. We were still young, finding our way. Krista Ames Cook has done a wonderful job of gathering up our story, and a book will be published next year that you'll be able to see. In that book, uh, she shows pictures of the work that went on in the old location down at Ninth and C, and there she shows pictures of a Thanksgiving table. Um, at that Thanksgiving table, uh, people came and gathered. It's an empty table there, but it soon filled up, and during those days, they met for social services at a beautiful old Victorian house. It was the social service department. On the sign, I don't think you can make it out, but on one side it says reading room there on what would be your right. And on the left-hand side, there is this interesting little scripture refrain not to be ministered unto, but to minister. There's also, by the way, if any of you need it, uh, free office space advertised there in the window. <laughs> I wonder what that space would cost today. They gathered there to share social services with that community, a uh, place to sleep, food, clothing, and Thanksgiving in 1916, the people there in the social services department and some of the people they were serving met together for a Thanksgiving dinner. Uh, you can see, uh, there they are, they, there were 20 or so, and I look at that slide and as I see those people, there is one face that stands out for me. Do you see it? Yeah, I wonder who that little fellow is. I wonder what became of him. It's none of you, is it? I guess not. I wonder about his identity, what he was seeing through those eyes in that time. The church not to be ministered to, but to minister. Social psychologist Christina Cleveland has said that the church in this day and time has become the Burger King church. Have it your way. Have it your way. We're a franchise. We'll give you what you want. Is there any kind of music you want, any kind of uh, program? We'll give it to you. Have it your way. Burger King Christianity. It was very different for this young group of people. They were saying just the opposite, not to be served, but to serve. It's the ability to see the world in a fresh new way. 
Educators and psychologists talk about the playful imagination of children, their ability to see the world in a more open space, in a, a more open way. Sister Joan Chittister writes, at the age of five, we're still imagining that we can be firefighters or police officers or truck drivers or doctors or ballerinas or teachers or pilots. And the years pass. Why, within two or three years, we're so wise, we've forgotten all of that. And we begin to be buffeted by the realities of the world around us. We try some things, they fail. We try some others. We knock on this door, we knock on that. And as she says, we become adults, but the difference is that we're usually far less open about our fears, our ambivalence, our arrogance. We're now afraid to try out new things as we would do when we were children. Many children in this nation and in this state aren't given the opportunity for much playful imagination. Two million, nearly two million children in California live in persistent poverty. That's about 18% of the children in this state. Here's the interesting thing. 83% of them live in a household where a parent is working full time. And yet they live in poverty. Oh, we do better than the nation. The nation generally is 21% living in poverty. I won't tell you about San Diego specifically, but it's closer to the nation than the state's average. Children who may not have the opportunity to dream in new ways because of the realities. I will say that California offers children a social safety net that many states do not. If we didn't, there would be three million children, more than three million children, who lived in persistent poverty. Maybe you saw this week in the New York Times, I think it was on Friday, this incredible feature story Cameras were given and training and photographers were given to young women around the world who were 18 years old. And their task was to provide photographs on the theme, this is 18. This is what it looks like to be 18. This is my world and so Photographs were taken from Russia uh, to Rwanda, uh, from, from Bangladesh to Bedford-Stuyvesant, from Nairobi, Kenya to South Korea. There you see images that young women experience in our time and in our day. When I think about this ability to have fresh eyes, young eyes, even as an adult, there's one person in my memory who as an adult understood what it meant to live as a child, even as an adult. You know him. Yes, uh, maybe you even saw the movie, Won't You Be My Neighbor? It's Fred Rogers. Maybe you remember the scene between Fred Rogers and Jeffrey Erlanger. Watch. So, well, you have a lot of things going on when you are. This just shows you have a lot of things happen to you when you're handicapped, but most of the time. But, and sometimes uh, it happens when you're not handicapped. Of course. But you're able to talk about those things. Yeah. So well and help other people mm -hmm. who might have the same kinds of things. Mm -hmm. uh, do you know that song that I sometimes sing called It's You I Like? Mm -hmm. 
I'd like to sing that to you and with you. Okay, okay? sure. It's you I like. It's not the things you wear. It's not the way you do your hair. But it's you I like. The way you are right now. The way down deep inside you. Not the things that hide you. Not your fancy chair. <laughs> That's just beside you. But it's you I like. Every part of you. Your skin, your eyes, your feelings, whether old or new. I hope that you remember, even when you're feeling blue, that it's you I like, it's you yourself, it's you. It's an honor to be here tonight, to be part of your proud mom this proud moment. You know, when, when you tell people that it's you I, it's you I like, you, we know that you really mean it. And tonight, I want to let you know that on behalf of millions of children and grown-ups, it is you that I like. This is where I should have had a warning to have your handkerchiefs ready. <laughs> what an amazing man. The ability through his life to model an openness so clearly that he too had an inner child that was welcoming new opportunities. I, I remember several years ago when I was a pastor in a urban setting, and one day after we had three worship services, Elaine went home to prepare a meal, and I waited at the church. I had work to do. I finished early and came out and sat on the steps of that old church, and within 30 seconds, it seemed, uh, suddenly uh, there were children everywhere around me, urchins everywhere. Well, there were only four of them, but it seemed that they were everywhere. <laughs> And I remember their dirty fingers and their snotty nose and their dirty faces. And uh, one little girl who must have been five or six just came and looked me in the face and said, uh, so where do you live? I said, a few blocks away. And then she said, and what do you do here? And I tried to explain and she didn't listen. She just turned around and flopped right down in my lap. And her little brother who happened to have wet pants began to crawl up on my shoulder. And she rifled through my papers and books, and uh, I tried to be attentive, but didn't do a very good job. And finally, she took her hands and put them on my face and looked at me, and she said, you don't know what to do with us, do you? <laughs> and the truth is, I didn't. I was like those disciples, right? They didn't know what to do. People had come tugging, wanting, wanting attention. They tried to shoo the children away. 
In, in both Matthew 9 and Matthew 10, we have a similar story here, and it goes on in the Gospels and other places. You know, Nicodemus comes to Jesus and says, what must I do to be born, to have eternal life? And Jesus says something strange. He says, you must be born from above, born again. And, and Nicodemus says, uh, do I, how can I become a child again? Great questions. I can hear the disciples asking Jesus, young, young, how, how young do we have to be? They shouldn't have worried. Just a few verses later, Jesus calls them children. They're beginning to get it. They're beginning to understand. Frederick Beekner summarizes all of this biblical material about children with two words. He says, all of this can be summarized with the words, be open. Be open. Look to see the world in new ways. Children, he says, act out of the truth of their own nature. Be like children. Be open to all the possibilities. Don't write things off as impossible because of what the world may say. Oh, there's also Donald Crable, who gives us another take on this. He said, these children, these small fry, actually became the model citizens for the new kingdom of God. They didn't make social distinctions among people. They didn't place people in boxes. So, be like these children. Be open. Don't put people in boxes. I think of that little boy at the table. I think of the children in the Children's Growth Center down here. I stop and just watch them play sometimes. I think of the children that went off to church school. I think of my own grandchildren. What do the scriptures say? If you've forgotten the meaning, it was right there on that sign for the social service department, not to be ministered unto, but to minister. You see, we believe in transformation, even as those people in the early 20th century did. Change of heart, new eyes, new abilities to see. Oh, by the way, as I was putting this sermon together, I did discover the identity of that little boy. I, I thought about it and I prayed about it. I searched the books and finally it came to me. That little boy, well, well, his identity, he, he's a child of God. And so are you. At the end of August, we sent a small uh, missions team to Tanzania to work with our uh, missionary there, Reverend Mutwali. And at this time, I am going to invite Sandy Price to come up and share uh, about their experience there. Thank you, Melissa. This time, I'd like to give a special thank you to Ed and Beryl Flom, who generously uh, donated to the mission trip. I'd also like to thank all of you who also donated during our fundraisers. It's very appreciated. There were five of us who went on the mission trip, three from this church and two from the Foothills United Methodist Church. You're right too close to this. And uh, our destination was Dar es Salaam, which is located on the, on the uh, central coast of Tanzania, and you can see it there on the slide. So, uh, Matwali Wamushidi is, has been our covenant uh, missionary there for many years. We've been supporting him, and he turned out to be our main contact, our host, our director, interpreter, and friend. 
While there, our team of five participated in the construction of a two-room preschool for the local children. We cleared a field, uh, dug trenches, carried cement blocks, raked debris, and enjoyed being with the local people. Unfortunately, the, the weedy field, although transformed into this nine-foot structure, is not finished because of lack of funding. We only took enough to go so far, and then they have to wait till the next funding comes along. Well, our team arrived in Dar es Salaam tired and ignorant of the lives we were about to embrace. We were touched by the vibrant faith in Jesus Christ that is alive in the people we met, and we left Dar es Salaam enriched. A two-room school building was begun, and people halfway around the globe joined together to, in work and in worship. I ask you to pray for Mithwali and for the youth and families of the small churches being planted all over Tanzania. Most importantly, would you please donate to Global Missions so that the work being done there can continue. Thank you. Last year, we were able to support two missionaries, one in Tanzania and one in Cambodia, with uh, $20,000 toward their uh, expenses. This year, we have promised to support them with $30,000, with the hope that eventually we will fully support one with 50. Uh, so in your bulletins, you have an envelope that says Global Missions, and if you're able, you are invited to, uh, to support our missionaries and the mission work that we do in this church. As we continue in worship, I invite the ushers to come forward.
May the Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord, we give you today what is already yours. You provide so much for us. Blessings pressed down, shaken together, running over. Thank you for giving us the ability to give and cheerful hearts to do it. Amen. Now may you go in peace, remembering the Christ-given ability to receive God's world even like children, and to live in that world not to be ministered unto, but to minister. And may you go knowing that you are being redeemed in the name of the Creator and the Redeemer and the Sanctifying Spirit. Amen.
Thank you, Javon, very much. Good morning. It's great to have you here in worship today. It's our delight to see you. Uh, you'll see announcements here in the bulletin. If you're new with us, uh, we invite you following the service to slip out across, out these doors to the patio and someone will be there to share information with you. I invite you to find the blue card that's in your pew and would you please register your attendance there. Uh, on Saturday, this coming Saturday, we'll be having a special church uh, council meeting. Uh, and it's very special because we're going to break right in the middle of it and have a baptism. There was a baptism already scheduled, and we thought we're just going to build the two meetings around it. It may help us understand why we do what we do. So Saturday at 9.30 here in the sanctuary. I want to remind you that it's not too late. As a matter of fact, you've got another month uh, to give any ideas, uh, suggestions, uh, characteristics, qualifications, attributes you would like to see in the next senior pastor. The bishop will be meeting with the pastor parish committee this Tuesday evening. He'll be in town. And it's not, uh, even after that, there'll be a chance for you to do that. So there are suggestion boxes in Linder Hall and in the church office, and you can also go online and add any word there. A book study coming up next Sunday in Trotter Chapel at 4.30. Uh, we're reading together Frederick Beekner's book, The Remarkable Ordinary. And you don't have to have read the book. You're welcome just to come. We'll be doing a book study every month. Uh, Coffee and Conversation will be coming up later this month. I think it's on the 24th. And finally, the lovely altar flowers today are uh, given in loving memory of Nirmala Sundardas. Sundardas, did I get it close? Very good. What an honor to uh, have those flowers today. Uh, she departed two years ago to dwell in the house of the Lord forever, and so the flowers presented by her family are recognized today. I believe those are all of the announcements I have for us now. Um, you know, today I probably was greeted with the words, the peace of Christ, at least 30 times. So I'm, I'm, I'm heading for 50, and you're doing really well. This is your opportunity to make it 31 for me, or maybe more. So, dear brothers and sisters, may the peace of Christ be with you. Would you please share with one another the peace of, signs of the peace of Christ? Now, could I invite you to remain standing as the choir begins our worship with the introit.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Dear Lord, of thee three things I pray, to see thee more clearly, love thee more dearly, follow thee more nearly, day by day. Amen. Amen. The prayer quilt is for Virgil Vizina. We invite you to stop at the table on the plaza, say a prayer, and tie a knot, even if you don't know the person receiving the prayer quilt. God's word says, be still and know that I am God. Let us quietly recognize God's presence as we prepare to pray. Almighty God, giver of life, we come before you this morning in gratitude and praise. We thank you for the assurance of your presence during uncertain times. We are grateful for your promises of the abundance that is to come. May your care of us be shown through our care of others. We ask your loving guidance of our young children, the babies and toddlers in our nurseries and classrooms. As a church, we have the privilege and responsibility 
to raise these little ones, and we want to do our very best. We are thankful for the volunteers who care for them and interact with them week after week here at church. We ask discernment for our older children, the youth who are a vital part of our church and of its ministry. Their outlook and values are being determined during these years. Lord, we know they watch us, and what we do as individuals and as a church helps determine who and what they will become. They face pressures and temptations every day. We pray that they will be strong and that they will be faithful to you. We pray for the moms and dads, step-parents, grandparents, and all who play a parental role in a child's life. We ask for strength and patience and kindness. Guide us to be the parents our little ones deserve. We know we're not perfect and we make mistakes. Help us, Lord, and give us endurance to be loving and caring. And Lord, when we do make mistakes, please help our kids to know that we love them and that we're trying to do right. And this morning, we lift up the individual needs of our congregation. Lord, please look down inside each one of us and understand the cares, the burdens, the hurts, the problems and worries that are there. We lift up our hearts to you for your individual touch and the assurance that you are with us, that you know and you care. Guide us to share your abundance with others as we go forth this week. Let the prayer quilt and our good wishes for Virgil bring comfort. Accept our prayers and grant us your abiding peace through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. During this month, we're offering a witness to the generosity of God. These children are witness enough, the great gift that God gives us. You're also going to hear from Sandy Price in just a moment about the trip to Tanzania that our global missions group participated in. But I just wanted to take this moment to say thank you for your generosity and for making these good things happen. Please join me in the prayer for illumination. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen.
Please stand as you are comfortable for the reading of the gospel. It comes today from the book of Mark, chapter 10, verses 13 through 16. People were bringing little children to him in order that he might touch them. And the disciples spoke sternly to them. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, Let the children children come to me. Do not stop them. For it is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Truly, I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. And he, told them, and he took them up in his arms, laid his hands on them, and bless them. The Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. That wonderful Lutheran pastor, Walter Wandgren Jr., in his little book written for baptism, has a poem near the front. It's one that I've often used and one that rings uh, with me each time I read it. Hear these words. All of us now on earth and in heaven one mouth, ten mouths, ten million and seven. Greet you, friend, we're glad you came. So glad we stand and applaud. And we call you by your brand new name. Beautiful, beautiful child of flame. You are the child of God. Would you bow with me as we pray together? And now will God extend the boundaries of our imagination, open our minds and hearts that we may come to you as your children in this time and in this place, for you are our guide and our inspiration. You are our salvation and our eternal hope. Amen. Many of you know that beginning next year and actually groups are already working on this, we'll be celebrating the 150th anniversary of this congregation. 
15 decades here in San Diego. Fairly, fairly remarkable, don't you think? But guess what? We're still a young church. When you compare to some of the churches that I visited, oh, in uh, the West Bank or in Syria, even in India, we're just, uh, we're just a toddler as it, go, as it comes to churches. It was on February the 6th, 1869, that a group of 17 Methodists gathered in an abandoned army barracks and held their first Methodist meeting here. I can picture it because I've read some about those meetings. You know, they didn't have electric lights. In the evening, in order for someone to read the scriptures, another person would come and stand with a candle so that the scriptures could be seen to be read. That church grew, and uh, Krista Cook Ames has done a great job of collecting up a lot of this history. And during this time when we're talking about setting the table for the future, uh, she's given us some images, images of a table that will sh was set up in the social service department there down at 9th and C where the church was. Do we have that slide? Hello, there we are. Oh, there you go. That's the table that was in the social service building. They say they fed 20 or so. It was in the building that was called a social service department, not far from the church. And it was a lovely old Victorian house. I don't think you can read the sign, but on one side it says reading room. On the other side is this very interesting uh, selection from scripture and it reads, not to be ministered unto, but to minister. Not to be ministered unto, but to minister. Up on the window there, it says, free office space. Try to find that in downtown San Diego today. That was the social service department in 1906. At Thanksgiving of that year, a group gathered and ate together. Twenty or so were, at, were present for the meal. When you look at that picture, there's one person, one face that stands out. Maybe not to you, but it does to me. It leaps off the screen. Do you see the young boy? There he is. I find myself wondering about him. Could it be a young Ross Stone? No, I don't think you're that old, Ross. 1916. There they are, gathered. I wonder who he was, who his family was. What happened to him? Where did he end up in life? You know, this church was shaped right after the Civil War. Imagine it, four years after the Civil War. I suspect that in the city, in the little town that was here then, uh, the rebel uh, uh, troops, the former rebel troops and the former Yankee troops had to walk on different sides of the street. But there was one place that welcomed them to worship together in that Methodist meeting. And by 1916, we had an outreach that was focused around the words, not to be ministered unto, but to minister. A social psychologist, Christina Cook, has looked at the church today, and she's written that we have now come to a point where we have Burger King Christianity. By that, she means Christianity these days, as practiced in the United States, is sort of have it your way Christianity. What would you like? What kind of music? What kind of programming? Have it your way Christianity. How different that is from 1916, from that young church that says not to be ministered unto, but to minister. You see, friends, 
childhood, like reflected in that little boy, is a time for imagination. The psychologists and educators tell us that this is a period of playful imagination. I think it was for that church down at 9th and C in 1916. Lots of options, lots of places to minister. Sister Joan Chittister in the book Following the Path writes, at age, at age five, we want to be firefighters, police officers, truck drivers, doctors, ballerinas, teachers, or pilots. She said, but we grow up, and in only a year or two, we begin to pass those dreams. It's part of childhood development, and we keep running into new opportunities and new barriers. We move forward and then turn around and go another direction. Chittister says, adults are still like children, but there's one big difference. We are usually much less open by the time we're adults. Our fears, our arrogance, our ambivalence tend to control what we can see and what we do. We stop trying the things that we were able to try as children. Some children in the state of California don't have the luxury of this imaginative play. We have almost two million children in this state that live in persistent poverty. In the United States, it's 15 and a half million. One out of every five children experiences a time of persistent poverty. We do a little better in California. It's only 19% of our population. It's 22% nationally. Can you imagine what's happening to shape or narrow the dreams of those little ones? And here's the astonishing thing. Those children live in households where 83% have at least one adult that's working full time during the year. We do some better in California because of the social safety net here. Uh, if we didn't have it, uh, the projections are that we would have three and a half million children that lived in persistent poverty. So good on us, but maybe not. Maybe there's more we need to be thinking about. Did you happen to see this week in the New York Times? I would encourage you to take a look. I think it was on Friday. There came out an essay, a feature story, uh, that was photography taken by young women who were 18 years of age. And it's simply titled, This is 18. And the photographs are taken from all over the world. Their assignment was to show us their community at age 18. In their daily lives, we saw the reality of these young people, uh, some from Russia, some from Rwanda, some from South Korea, some from uh, Kenya. Let's see the slides that were there. Young woman in Nairobi, Kenya, that's the image there. Earlier was a young woman in Bangladesh. Few people fully capture what it means to live as adults and yet be open as a child. Think about it. Can you think of any? I don't do very well, but I'll tell you someone who I think does. Do you remember? Fred Rogers, have you seen the movie, Won't You Be My Neighbor? Do you know the way he brought an openness to children and the child inside his breast? 
You may recall the scene where Fred Rogers and a young boy, Jeff Erlinger, greet one another. Watch this video. So, well, you have a lot of things going on when you're... This just shows you have a lot of things happen to you when you're handicapped, but most of the time. But, and uh, sometimes it happens when you're not handicapped. Of course. But you're able to talk about those things. Yeah. So well, and help other people. Mm hmm Who might have the same kinds of things. Mm hmm Uh, do you know that song that I sometimes sing called, It's You I Like? Mm hmm I'd like to sing that to you and with you. Okay, okay, sure. It's you I like. It's not the things you wear. It's not the way you do your hair. But it's you I like. The way you are right now. The way down deep inside you. Not the things that I do. Not your fancy chair. <laughs> That's just beside you. But it's you I like. Every part of you. Your skin, your eyes, your feelings. Whether old or new. I hope that you remember even when you're feeling blue, that it's you I like, it's you yourself, it's you, it's you. Welcome, Jeffrey Erlinger. Oh, I'm so glad to see you. Oh, thank you for coming. My pleasure. Oh. It is hard. What a surprise. I love the bathroom. It's, a, it's an honor to be here tonight, to be part of your proud mom, this proud moment. You know, when, when you tell people that it's you I, it's you I like, you, we know that you really mean it. And tonight, I want to let you know that on behalf of millions of children and grown-ups, it is you that I like. So I should have had a warning that this is a two Kleenex sermon. <laughs> I remember the Sunday that I had preached three times and Elaine went home to prepare the meal. I still had work at the church to do. And I finished up and then uh, went out and sat on the steps there outside the church. And suddenly there was a whole brigade of children. Actually, there were only four, but it felt like a brigade. There they were. I can still see their dirty fingers, their snotty noses. Uh, one little boy had wet pants. And they came and stood around me. Uh, one little girl began to play with my hair. And she said, so where do you live? And I said, well, just a few blocks up there. And well, well, what do you do here? And I tried to tell her. And about the time I got to the point of being a pastor, she clearly didn't understand. She just plopped right down in my lap and took the books and papers that I had and began to rifle through them and asked me more questions I didn't answer very well. Her little brother was crawling up on my shoulder and I can still remember she took her hands and put them on my face and looked me square in the eye and said, you don't know what to do with us, do you? <laughs> and I didn't. I was just like those disciples we read about in Mark 9 and Mark 10. 
They wanted to shoo the children away. Don't bother us. We're, we're doing important adult things here. Uh, stay, out of, stay out of our path. This is Jesus. Don't you know that he's going to lead a parade and we're going to be important? And Jesus said, whoa, 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 whoa. Bring those little children to me. Forbid them not. You see, they're the substance of the kingdom of heaven. Frederick Beatner captures these two passages, gives it a summary. Oh, he's so good. He gives it a two-word summary, what's going on here. Beekner says what Jesus is teaching is be open. Be open to see and receive the kingdom of God that is all around you. Children act out of the truth of their nature, he says. Be like children. Be open to all the possibilities. Don't write things off as impossible just because that's what the world says. Be open. Mark 10 and Mark 9 both call on the disciples to be as children. Now, here's the good news. Apparently, the disciples got it because just eight verses later, after the passage in Mark, he turns to the disciples and he says, Now, children, or there are other passages throughout Scripture where Jesus speaks of the little ones or the children. John's gospel is full of little ones talk. And you know there's that story. Well, if you don't, you've seen the banner at football games, John 3, 16. Nicodemus comes and says, what must I do to have eternal life? And Jesus says, what? You must be born again. Or better translated, born from above. The idea is that you can have renewed possibility here. We've turned that into one conversion experience, uh, and it's important, but Jesus is saying more. And Nicodemus says, how do I do this? How can one become a child after you're an adult? The invitation continues to be to be open, to be renewed, Donald Crabill, looking at these passages, says, Jesus not only spent a lot of time with small fry, he also said that they're the models for what it means to be a citizen in God's kingdom. Children do not make social distinctions, he says. They don't put people in boxes. So two lessons here. Be open don't be so quick to put people in categories. Be like a child. Well, I think of that little boy in the photo. And I think of the children that play out here at the Children's Growth Center. I, I stop sometimes just to watch them for a while. And I think of my own grandchildren. Ah. They're a joy for all of us. Grandchildren who come and don't already have all the categories set up that are open to what God may be doing in their lives. You know, I've been thinking a lot about the transformation that we believe in, the conversion, the call to renewal. That's what those people down at the social service department near 9th and C were all about. That's why they had this sign uh, not to be ministered unto, but to minister. And you know, as I've thought about it and as I've studied, I have figured out the identity of that little boy. I have. I've, I've, I've got it sorted out now. I can tell you whose child he is. That little boy is a child of God. And so are you.
As we continue in worship, we'll now hear a report from Sandy Price, who will bring news of a recently concluded mission trip to Tanzania. Thank you, Pastor John. At this time, I'd also like to express extreme gratitude to Ed and Beryl Flom, who generously supported our mission trip, and to all the other people who also donated when we had fundraisers the, during the past year. Well, our trip took us to Dar es Salaam in Tanzania. Could we have the map up on the slide? Uh, Dar es Salaam is on the central coast of Tanzania, and it's a large metropolitan community. But it stretches and stretches, and our work site was about an hour and a half drive every day to and from the work site. We went there to build a preschool for um, the children of Dar es Salaam. Mutwali um, Wa Mushidi, it's hard for me to say that because I don't speak Swahili. The covenant missionary we've been supporting for many years was our main contact. He was our host, our director, our interpreter, and our friend. While there, we participated in the construction of a two-room uh, preschool. First, we had to clear a cassava field of weeds and debris. We raked and carried and scraped and uh, lugged uh, cassava roots and even carried cement blocks. We worked very hard, but unfortunately, the funding that we took with us only uh, allowed us to complete a portion of that school. I want to tell you about the beautiful children, the high energy church services, the sweet boy with malaria, the stunning guest house, and the freshly harvested cassava, uh, and the not so pleasant taste of ugali. But perhaps I'll save that for another time. Our, time, our team arrived in Dar es Salaam tired and ignorant of the lives of the people we were about to embrace. We were touched, though, by the vibrant faith they have in Jesus Christ. And we left enriched by knowing them. A two-room school building was begun, and people halfway around the globe reached out, joined together in work and in worship. I ask you to pray for Matwali and for all the families of the new church startups that are going on all over Tanzania. Most importantly, please donate generously to Global Missions so that the work there can continue. Thank you. Thank you, Sandy. The ushers will now come forward to receive our tithes and offerings.
Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord, we give you today what is already yours. You provide so much for us, blessings pressed down, shaken together, running over. Thank you for giving us the ability to give and cheerful hearts to do it. Amen. Depart now in the goodness of God the Father, and as you go, remember the goodness of God. You were born into this world, and as a child, by God's grace, you grew up. You have been under God's good grace all the day long until this hour. And so now, may you go with the love of God in your heart, an awareness of the fellowship of the Holy Spirit among us and the love of Christ the Redeemer, continuing to remind you that you are being redeemed. Amen. <laughs>